Okay. <laughs> I think she's coming back on board here. Sorry about that, everyone. Donna, we just need to unmute you, please. Yeah. Oh, okay, I just moved outside instead of the greenhouse. I wanted to be in the greenhouse, but I wondered if it was too far away from the Wi-Fi or if there's something else happening on your end. I don't know. No, everything's good here. And then it wouldn't let me just log back in. I had to type everything in again. It was just like, oh, hello. <laughs> well, hello, everyone. Sorry for this. We feel like amateurs and we have done this before, but <laughs> trying to make it all good. Sometimes you can't account for uh, technology, right? So, so I'm going to go back and start sharing the presentation again. Okay. We're already on slide three or so, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Let's start with the season summary right there. Third slide. Okay. So everyone can see. I can see it. Great. Where are we all from? Do you know, Angela, where everyone's from? I'm so sorry. I don't actually. Okay. It's all right. I like it when people sign that in at the beginning, or maybe they can put that in the chat room. Oh, there's Charles. He's from Maine, Lyle, yeah. <laughs> Minnesota. So that's fantastic. That's coming up in the chat. Appreciate that. Okay, so let's not show them my lemons then. Let's move on. <laughs> all right, season summary. Just how did the season go for everyone, and how can you prepare for winter? So we're going to look just a little bit. Oh, there's somebody, Julie, in Vancouver. Thanks, Julie and Suzanne from Pritis. Love it. Well, you guys will be preparing your questions, too, because it's so much fun answering your questions. Okay, moving on. How did the season go for you? Well, the season went really great for me. It started bad, but I had this, for instance, is a three-year-old lemon that I had, and it has about 50 lemons on it. So that I've decided to keep this little... Uh, lemon in my greenhouse for like just live there forever I was moving it in and out putting it in the garage putting it in the basement but I've decided it's three years now it's uh, got 50 lemons on it going to keep it outside the Romnia another winner for me this year people kept walking and we had quite a drought here on Vancouver Island I don't know everyone had crazy weather I think that's the only way we can summarize the summer everyone had crazy weather and so the Romnia was something that people keep asking me about. So in 2020, I took a bunch of cuttings and brought them into my greenhouse. I must have had 100 cuttings and only about five really took. So quite different from lemons. They took 100 lemon cuttings. I got 80 lemons. Romnia, not as lucky, but the flowers are fantastic. They're huge. So when you've got a flower that's six inches across, it's a showstopper. The other new thing I tried this year was aluminette. And you can see that shade cloth. It does look like aluminum. And it is shade cloth that has an aluminum reflective surface on it. Because, you know, it's so fantastic to grow lettuce all year long. And then come kind of late summer, like August, it's just too hot. So I put that aluminette right over top of my lettuce. Next slide. So a few years ago, if you were around for that long with BC Greenhouse, uh, we looked at growing the strawberries in rain gutters in the greenhouse. And because they were in the greenhouse, I started getting strawberries in May. But I found a couple of years ago, strawberries are like a magnet for bugs. So what we did this year is at the end of May, when the weather was better, we cleared the decks and we moved them outside and I've had continuous strawberries right through from me. So that's been fantastic. I've also had tons of grandchildren visiting me and they have been potting up little plants. I mean, what am I gonna do with all these plants? <laughs> then they leave, they all fly home and they can't take them with them. But here's a couple of the little guys uh, putting together some echeveria. And I think the next slide shows, surprisingly they propagated them in August. And here's this tiny little growth on that echeveria that they propagated just a little sprout of a plant coming up. A lot of people call them hens and chicks, but echeveria is actually the one that we keep indoors as a house plant because it's, it's actually a type of succulent, not the same as hens and chicks, not a hardy plant. I also took literally hundreds of rosemary cuttings this year because rosemary was something that died for everybody last year. So I took a bunch of cuttings this spring and summer and people just love that. And big surprise, in my little greenhouse, I had brought all my, because people keep giving me their leftover amaryllis, I brought them all into my little greenhouse. And I always leave them on their side so that they don't accidentally get watered. And what happened is that they all started to send out leaves and flower buds. So I, I brought them outside. All right, 
Next one. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so I just wanted to show strawberries again because if you haven't been successful with strawberries, whether you're growing inside or outside, you have to go with one of the varieties that's called day neutral. So the day neutral ones don't care if you've got really short spring days or really long summer days, they just keep producing. And there's that same amaryllis again and that same little grandson with a nasturtium leaf on his nose. So carry on. So a couple more successes. I grew so many things in my greenhouse, including this little banana, this banana in the middle of that, this is my eight by 12 greenhouse. And that banana is called a blue banana. And it is supposed to be the hardiest banana from the coldest part of China. So we'll wait and see, I haven't had any blue bananas yet, but I, I grew this in the greenhouse that I was not heating. Now in Minnesota or in some of the other areas, uh, for sure, you'd have to heat your greenhouse, but it's just something I'm trying. The, do, the top leaves do die back and it all sprouts up in the spring, but a lot of these plants, a lot of these flowers, you probably don't recognize it, Angela, but that one planter you gave me, I think in June, I put the backdrop here. So it was just a crazy summer. I also want to mention Seychelles beans. I highlighted Seychelles beans because they're French beans. So the ones that are super skinny and long and so tasty, and these are climbing beans. So even though this was outside, I started them off first in the greenhouse, moved them outside, and they have been producing nonstop since early, early August. But I did have one failure, and the next slide is that. The failure for me this year was the wasabi radish. Honestly, when I read the seed catalogs in January, everything sounds good to me. And this wasabi radish, it looks beautiful. I transplanted it carefully into my greenhouse. It grew for about... 45 days and usually radishes are super tiny and you harvest them after 30 days but the wasabi radish took a bit longer and when I pulled it and sliced it guess what it tasted exactly like wasabi which was horrible in most of my foods it wasn't I'm not serving Chinese food every day I'm looking for something you know more tasty like a radish so unfortunately the only loser I think I really had this year was the wasabi radish so if you're big on sushi you're going to want to try the wasabi radish next year and if you're not you're going to just not grow that next year that was just a waste from my perspective <laughs> next slide so in March, I decided I better take a picture of my little greenhouse this is my eight by 12 because I have one bed in there that I like to grow you know, all kinds of things, including lettuces. I've got a couple kinds of lettuce here and I've got some cabbages. And then this is the same shot again later in April. And it's funny how it fades in like that. That's funny. Anyway, there you go. That is it in April. But this greenhouse completely full at that time in April. And I had to take everything out because we had eaten all the lettuce by the end of April and I planted it with all new things. So again, just a little snapshot of outside. So that's just what was happening in March and April. I know people are thinking that with the greenhouse, you can plant it once and you're done. And that's not quite true. At least I wouldn't want it to be true for me. I like to keep starting new things and keep transplanting new things. So outside, I had some surprises. One was the Joan J. Raspberry. I've never grown this one before. Last year was the first year. And it was growing outside, but I propagated it in the greenhouse. I took a lot of divisions and cuttings. And Joan Jay blooms from the very earliest when your first raspberries come in. Um, sorry, Lionel's just asking about zones. We were just asking what zone we're in. I'm in zone six, but raspberries grow everywhere. Joan Jay turns out to be an amazing raspberry because it's called a primal cane raspberry. So it, it blooms early in the spring on the old branches, the ones that were there from last year, but then it gets brand new branches. And this time of year, just last week, we started harvesting. Maybe it was two weeks ago. Now it goes by so fast. We started harvesting. So if you have not tried Joan Jay, it's amazing. I also want to point out that I'm growing the, um, I'm on my second or third or maybe seventh cut of broccoli right now. So in the spring, I always harvest that big head of broccoli in the middle. And that usually comes by late June or early July. And then after that, it's all just side sprouts, but they're just delicious. And Charlotte was a new type of raspberry I grew as well. It's a day neutral. And it's a small one, but it's uh, delicious. So heat retention. Angela asked me to touch on heat retention. I brought a couple of my blankets here, but um, I see that you can either see me or you can see, I'm only seeing Angela. So 
you're either seeing me or you're seeing uh, the slides and you're not able to see what I'm showing up. But Agribon 15. Can you want me to stop sharing for a second? No, no. I just, um, there is a way to change so that we're not looking at you. We're looking at me when I talk, but we do like looking at you, Angela. You're beautiful. Oh, God. I anyway, hope looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> so, Agribon 50, I do have. A couple of kinds of Agribon, I have 19, which only gives you a couple of degrees frost protection, and the 50, which can give you seven or eight degrees frost protection. So in Fahrenheit, I think that's about, I don't know what it is, but seven degrees Celsius is about 10. It's in the 40s. 40. Yeah, it's in the 40s. So in other words, if it's freezing, it's going to give you a little bit of extra help. So over winter, when we're looking for heat retention, we're really looking for the Agribon 50. And also I have a heater that I set at frost protection. And I set it that way so that it only, it's not running all the time. But I do have a few covers. This was just a poly cold frame and you can have this inside your greenhouse or you can have this outside your greenhouse. I don't actually use a poly uh, cold frame because I have two greenhouses, shortly gonna have three greenhouses. So I don't use that. But a lot of people will set up a little greenhouse inside their, inside their um, greenhouse. They'll set up a little cold frame. I also like to set up just the number nine wires. The number nine wire, I wonder if I can move that. Nope, I can't move my, it's over the writing that's in the corner there, but the number nine wire is just thin wire that you can cut. You can place it on your beds and then you can put fabric on top. And if you change the slide one more time, you'll see the name Agribon, I think, which is on this cover. There it is, Agribon over a frame. So a few years ago, again, this is my big greenhouse. We decided to keep the oranges and the lemons and the grapefruit in the big greenhouse, even though we got down to minus 13 last year, which is getting pretty close to zero, even if you're looking at Fahrenheit. And so we decided to put this Agribon over top of a frame. We stapled it. It was like a greenhouse inside our greenhouse. And that inside of that, we put a, a frost protection. So just a little tiny heater. We didn't want to have the whole greenhouse heated because we have a lot of cold tolerant things in there, but I wanted that little one. And you know what? Last year, even though it was even colder, we decided not to do that. But if you're looking for extra protection within your greenhouse, it's certainly possible to use poly. Okay. Fall and winter crops, things you can grow, things you can see, lots of ideas here for sure. And I've got some pictures too. So things to seed. If you are just looking at, whoops, we missed that slide coming and going. If you're looking at growing or improving your soil. If you've had some questions with your soil, we've got something you can do right now is you can get some fall rye. And a lot of people do grow a cover crop outside. I like to grow, and last year for the second time I had one inside my greenhouse. So that's just seeded, which would be any day now, seed your fall rye, just coming up takes two or three days and then it'll start growing. And fall rye can really enhance your soil and will feed all the microbes in your soil. So I wanted to show that. So that protects your soil throughout the winter if you're not growing in some of your beds. And some of us are growing in all of our beds all of the time, and some of us are switching it up. So when you pull all the plants out, it's nice to put something else in. Next slide. Okay, so some of the herbs and hardy crops that I like to grow are things like mizunas. Mizunas and spinach and arugula. These are things, mizunas are usually considered also called um, mustards, mustard greens. And mustard greens are amazing because they can take a lot of cold weather. And I also like to grow microgreens, but I do have to put those on my heat mat. They like the ground to be warm and then they're okay with the cold top. So many kinds of microgreens. And cilantro was an accidental microgreen. It started germinating in my greenhouse when we had a warm spell last October. And I actually, this is how it looks when it, it sprouts, but it actually formed full-size cilantro and we used it in all our recipes. So that was fantastic. Next one. So another thing that's really hardy is bok choy. And there's more than one name for bok choy, but it's super frost tolerant. I've actually seen this one growing in Saskatchewan and it comes out first thing in the spring, sort of in March, which is way too easy for you to think about it. So if you think about crops that grow outside as early as March, you know they're gonna do well for you in your greenhouse. And my bok choy came up last fall and we just ate it all fall. And here we go. This is my happy rich broccoli, the one that I seeded last October 26th. And once it came up and we were finished with the main heads, we kept 
sticking these side sprouts on the happy ridge. And this year, I didn't show you a picture of it, but I've still left one plant in my greenhouse and I'm going to collect seeds very soon. And the other one is the Romanesco cauliflower. Some people call it broccoli and I've seen it listed by both names in the catalogs, but the Romanesco can get a really intense green. It looks a bit washed out here. It gets really intense and I can eat that in my greenhouse in November or even December because it can take down to quite cold weather, well below zero Celsius and you know, in the teens in Fahrenheit. So that's next slide. That's a little video. We might have trouble with that. So I'll just uh, voice it. This is minus seven in Smithers. Smithers is the most northerly. It's an hour from Alaska. My, it's my son's garden. And we picked this spinach outside in his garden and it was minus eight overnight and there was a heavy frost on it and we picked it right after it thawed out and melted. So spinach is one of those crops. If you think, oh, I'm in central US, I can't grow, I'm in Minnesota, I can't grow spinach. Actually, you can. As soon as I take out my tomatoes, I'm already seeding my spinach. And this year, I kept all my plants with all the seeds. I just laid them on the shelf in my greenhouse. I'm going to just crumble them into the ground here shortly because spinach is one of the things that does not need heat. Another thing that people are surprised by that doesn't need a lot of heat are Meyer lemons. Meyer lemons can thrive down to minus seven Celsius or 19 Fahrenheit. I'm not saying you'll be able to keep it that warm in all greenhouses, but if you're in a region that can keep it that warm, it's amazing. I've had ripe lemons every month of the year here. The big surprise for me was head lettuce. Head lettuce like romaine does not like it more than about minus two Celsius. So that's just around 28 uh, degrees in Fahrenheit. And it's, in other words, just barely below freezing, head lettuce won't grow. Next one. So general fall work, uh, remove your plants before they get gray mold. I went on a big holiday last October. I don't know why I went to Alberta. You weren't, we weren't supposed to travel, but I took a trip, I came back. And the tomatoes I had left in all had gray mold on them. So that was really disgusting. I'm embarrassed to show you this picture. But take out the tomatoes before it gets so humid in your greenhouse. Start seeding other things like your microgreens. You can buy lots of kinds of microgreens. They're available everywhere at garden centers. And start harvesting, uh, planting things like radish. This is last fall. I forgot my hair changed so much in the last year. This is last fall. I planted my radishes in mid-September and we were eating them by late October because they really don't take more than a month just a normal radish to grow. Next one. Another fall winter jobs. I want everyone to remember to wash the greenhouse now. Embarrassingly last year I washed it with a big scrub brush. I think we've got another video but I don't know if it'll work. So we'll just use the, um, there we go. We just uh, use a, actually a car wash brush with soap on it and we just used soap and water. So this was in later October. I washed the inside of the greenhouse. I washed the outside because a lot of bugs like spider mites like to actually stay in the little cracks in your greenhouse. So if you can give it a good thorough washing in the later fall, then that's the perfect time. Just with soap and water, wash the greenhouse inside and out. If you can do it, it's a great thing to do. And it really helps to get rid of some of those lingering or like I like to say, malingering insects that hang out for a long time. Oops. Other news, I just wanted to tell everyone if you're interested that I did buy a new house this year and that house is a 12 hour drive from where I am now. So it's in a zone three. So if you've been following this long story of mine, I have actually moved my small greenhouse here from Calgary. And now we bought another house in Calgary. We just missed those grandkids. So here's my new house, tiny little bungalow. We have a small house here in Qualicum Beach as well. So because of my new house, I've been felt like I had to order a new greenhouse and <clears throat> I had to order a new greenhouse. So because of that, I have to sell my big greenhouse. So you won't be able to have it if you're far away. It is not difficult. My husband took our other greenhouse apart and we moved it, but it is 260 pieces and we've decided not to move our little greenhouse. Instead, we have bought a new greenhouse. So something new for Donna, still going with polycarbonate changing the front of the greenhouse so that the front will be glass this time and just the top and the back will be poly. So if you can do it, order yourself a new greenhouse and uh, 
hopefully we'll sell our old greenhouse. Next one. So I just want to remind everyone, uh, if you haven't been keeping track, you can do that in your journal. Angela has those on, uh, on the website, on the BC Greenhouse website. You can get your journal. This journal records three years in a row. So if you think you had it hard this year, write it down, compare it to next year. I know for me, we had things like grapes, which weren't ready until so much later this year than last year. So keep track of all of that stuff, either on my website or the BC Greenhouse website. Next one. So thanks for joining me. We're going to be open for questions. So hopefully I'll be able to um, be able to jump in and answer your questions for people. But before we do that, I'm just going to show this, this Agribond because I brought out the samples. So you can't really tell, but you can buy it. The 50 Agribond is quite heavy and the 19 is quite light. So in the summer, I use the 19 because if you get the heavy, heavy, heavy Agribond in the summer and you put it out on your crops it'll actually heat things up too much so the we use the very fine the 19 the agribond 19 in the summer and we can just lay that right over top of crops and in the fall and winter especially in the greenhouse i use the heavier one called agribond 50 it's a bit heavier it's the one that gives us that 15 or so degrees fahrenheit maybe seven degrees celsius um sort of frost protection and it's a really good one. It would be too warm for the summer, but it's perfect in the greenhouse as an extra cover. So I wanted to just show that one. Great. So there is um, a message here, a question from Roger, when he's asking for suggestions for growing in the greenhouse, whether that be containers, benches, or in a garden bed. He wants to know what to grow or how to grow. Um, for how to grow. So containers, benches, or in a garden bed. I have all three. I have a very small bench. I have in my big greenhouse, two sides are growing beds. In my little greenhouse, I only have one side that's a growing bed because some plants like peppers and tomatoes really like you to change out the soil every year. So I have all my, my peppers growing in grow bags and I change out the soil every year. I just put the old soil into my garden, my outdoor garden, and I bring in my new compost and I mix that compost with uh, maybe I buy some bag soil or something like that. So I do try to have for my, um, for my uh, peppers and even my tomatoes, I try to have new soil every year. So I do grow in bags. My bench is only used for getting things started. So when I root my Romnia that you saw earlier, or when I root my lemons, or I tried some finger limes. Actually, I just took some more finger lime pictures, just like I just took 36 cuttings again yesterday. But when I do that, I do it on my bench. And I have a heat pad on my bench. And I have a plug-in in my bench. My first mistake in my first greenhouse is that we didn't have, we didn't have um, a plug-in. So we do in our new one. So that's how I grow it. Everything's a little bit differently. Uh, you can certainly email me. I know Angela always forwards the emails if you send them to her, and I can answer you in more detail if you need more help on that. But I would say if you're just setting up a greenhouse, make sure you have some pots, some in-ground growing, and some uh, bench area. And my bench area is really just the size of my large uh, pad. Um, Roger actually had a follow-up question to you about managing space for seedlings and growing veggies. So it might be a good chance to sort of talk about your crop rotations because you're pretty active with that. Yeah, I am. So you can just uh, plant something like the fall rye and say goodbye to your greenhouse and go south for the winter. But I like to just keep growing. So if I'm growing fall rye, that might just be in for a month while I get something else started on my bench. And something like radishes doesn't like transplanting. So I seed that directly into either a big pot or right into the soil, takes 30 to 45 days to grow radish. It's shockingly fast. Something like arugula, I started, I made a note of it in my journal. I started it last October 27th and I was harvesting arugula. And I just see it, when I say started it, I put it directly into the soil in one of my soil beds in my small greenhouse. And it makes a difference because the small greenhouse stays a bit colder than the big greenhouse. I put it directly in the soil in the small greenhouse and I was eating arugula on my pizzas and in my salads come the end of January. So things grow slower in the winter. And that's the main thing you need to remember. It's not 
sometimes about cold because arugula, kale, mizunas, they can tolerate a lot of cold, but the light levels are so low. Come October 10th, we only have 10 hours of day, you know, daylight here. And if you're further south, it might be down to, I don't know, even less, or maybe you've got about even temperature, I don't know, like day lengths. But I find that when your day lengths get below 10 hours, it's really hard to grow. But just an example was I planted uh, arugula October 27th and I was eating it in January. Whereas uh, radishes that we might plant sort of today in, in first day of fall would be ready to eat by the end of October. So everything's a little bit different. It's almost easier to grow things that don't have one part that you eat, like flowering plants for me do not work at all during the winter because I certainly don't, um, I don't have enough light to grow those. And are you growing those radishes in beds as well? In the radishes I grow either in large pots, and I like the root bags, or I grow very large pots where I may have had a, a tomato. I can pull out that tomato top dress it a bit, put the radishes in, because they don't need much space. You just sprinkle them. They only need a few inches each. And I've also grown them in the open soil beds that I have. Um. So this is a common question you get. <laughs> How do you control aphids? Aphids are super easy. Last year we focused on bugs. Do you keep those old, um, do you keep those old tapes alive, uh, Angela, or have we lost that one already? And which one are we talking about? The old, the last time we got together and talked, we talked a lot about insects. I had a whole section on it. Yeah, you know what? We can forward those details when we forward the recording. Okay, so the old recording, and that's why I decided not to talk about them this time, was about insect control. And I do order, you can Google it online, uh, beneficial insects. And there's so many good beneficial insects. My favorite is aphidolides. It sounds like aphid, but it's a type of a parasite on aphids, aphidolides. And that is a fantastic uh, insect that you can purchase both in the States and in Canada, you just go online, purchase beneficial insects. Aphidolides is a really great one because each little bug looks like a miniature mosquito, but it will lay its egg inside an aphid. And so eventually you get so many aphidolides, you don't have any aphids. The truth is I never spray for aphids anymore because when I found out that you spray for aphids, you actually end up killing the beneficial bugs. So if you've been encouraging them by growing flowers, and I always grow alyssum in my greenhouse, I always have a few pots of alyssum because it will attract beneficial bugs. And it keeps them alive until you have aphids because you might not have aphids until fall. So I find that once you get into a cycle with your greenhouse and another um, anyway, once you get into a cycle and you start to bring in some of these bugs, you try not to spray. You don't want to kill them. You want to just encourage them to hang out in your greenhouse. Um, so we do have uh, Suzanne and Charles both asked about figs. So oh. can you talk about how you overwinter them when you start them in spring? And Suzanne is saying she needs some tips because the fruit keeps falling off. Right. So if you're growing figs in pots and the pot dries out because you've gone away for a month or nobody's been watering, it's the irregular water that will cause the baby figs to fall off. The second point with figs is that if you have a type of fig that produces an early crop, a braba crop, that type of fig, something like Desert King is the most common variety. It will, if you can keep it evenly watered, it will produce a crop in midsummer. It'll also get a later crop, a fall crop. And those often, most figs just have a later crop. And those are very hard to keep on your figs. I actually only grow the Desert King now. I have the other ones in pots, but I don't, I don't, I don't like them. The Desert King is the one I like because it produces that really great fig in August. And I like that a lot. So they do lose their leaves in the fall. They can tolerate some frost. And so if you can keep your greenhouse, even just the frost protection, if you can keep just a frost protection setting on your, on your heater, that's enough to keep figs alive. They, they can take frost like lemons, but they do lose all of their leaves in the fall. So keeping them out of the wind in your greenhouse with a little bit of frost protection, if you grow the right kind, and Desert King is one of the best kinds, then you should be okay. 
And then you just have to pay attention and make sure to water evenly. If you have trouble watering evenly, just put your pot, your individual pot into a tray that has water. And that's how I grew such beautiful peppers this year. I grew eight kinds of peppers. Oh, I picked some to show you and I forgot. Um, they're back in my greenhouse. Anyway, I did, I did put them into a tray um, because that's how I grow my peppers. I just water the tray and it would be the same with figs. That's how I would do that. Okay. So Cheryl has a really good question and this is gonna be a good connection point for you. She um, has her first year in her greenhouse in Calgary. She has no power this year and she's wondering about um, whether it's still worth the effort to grow winter veg. Without power, it's hard. And I'll tell you why, um, because it's the air movement that's almost the most important. So we talk about this a lot in our summer greenhouses. We want the fans to be on all the time. And I have just a small fan in my eight by 12 greenhouse. Just a little one, I got it from BC Greenhouse, of course. It's just a small fan, but I keep it plugged in all the time because it's the air movement. When the air keeps moving, you don't get as much cold. And the other thing in Calgary, if you wanna grow winter veg, you will be seasonal. So you'll seed your spinach and your probably mizunas anytime now, Cheryl. But when they come up, remember they might freeze solid, even your bok choy. But then come February, March, as the days warm up a bit more, as your soil thaws, I've actually seen in Calgary, even outdoors by March, I've seen spinach growing. So in your greenhouse, you'll be slightly ahead. You don't have to prevent frost, as you saw in my son's situation in Smithers, which is near Alaska. He was able to have a minus eight condition and his spinach was still good. So you won't get those kinds of temperatures all the time unless you spend a lot on heating. And I know Cheryl said she doesn't have electricity. So you can expect that if your spinach sprouts now, it'll just freeze and then it'll start growing again in March or April in the greenhouse. So that's what will happen with you, Cheryl. And I'm expecting the same when I, when I move to Calgary, which will be shortly. Um, do you have some advice on uh, companion planting? You must have some good tips for that. The best companion is a flower with your vegetables. If you just have vegetables, no flowers at all, you're not gonna be able to draw in all those beneficial insects. So the best companion plant that I've ever seen, ever, 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 is a lissom. It's a simple little white blooming flower. It'll reseed in your greenhouse, it reseeds outside, it grows even in sidewalk cracks. It's a fantastic companion because it produces so many tiny flowers. And when your bugs, your good bugs are looking for bad bugs and maybe they're not available yet, then what ends up happening is that they can feed on that flower. And so I've kind of gotten rid of most of my general knowledge of, of companion plants now that I've discovered alyssum because I just always have it. It feeds all of those little hoverflies, all of the beneficial bugs, and it keeps them alive until you can get the other insects growing. So I really love that. Other people will say things like, and I have done this, grow potatoes with beans. And so I've got some pots of potatoes where I've planted my beans because the, the beans themselves will produce over time some nitrogen but they also shade your potatoes. So you don't get as many potatoes in the pot, but the beans will help. And they also just generally improve your soil. So you can definitely be doing more rotations and more companion planting when you're growing in pots. When you're growing in one big bed, you don't wanna waste a lot of space for companion plants, but you may in fact decide just have a few hanging baskets because love your BC greenhouse. They've got those little grooves in them where you can, actually put a hanging basket in and then you can have some flowering herbs or some flowers like alyssum growing and that will help to not waste any of your ground space so that you can grow your beneficial or your vegetables in the ground. I hope that helps. Yeah so Lynn is asking if you're going to heat your greenhouse in Calgary. In Calgary I'm going to keep a fan going almost all the time because I've seen so many online research um, projects where even in Europe, in the, in the Swiss Alps, and I've been to the Swiss Alps, it gets cold there in the winter. It's not really the cold that kills the plants. It's that lack of airflow. So I'm definitely going to keep on um, definitely getting uh, a plug in. I'm definitely going to keep my fan going most of the year, but I'm not going to heat it. 
because I'm not going to try to grow green um, lemons in the greenhouse. I'm going to actually move my figs into my semi-heated garage and I'm going to have my lemons in a cold, I've got a, an area that's kind of a cold um, porch that I can put them in. And so it'll be cold, but not as cold as my greenhouse. Um, I feel like I should say on behalf of uh, BC Greenhouse, we feel that the, the air circulation is one of the most important things in a greenhouse and the one thing most often overlooked. And so if you it's want to uh, control condensation and prevent algae from forming in your greenhouse and control pests and um, move air around so you don't have cold and hot air pockets, you truly need air circulation in your, in your greenhouse. So, And I really just have that little tiny fan that you sell, Angela, and I just keep that going all the time. It's a very small fan, but it, it really works. And you can direct it to go more up. So it can push. I have it on the ground. I used to have it up on my shelf. And then I realized, oh, yeah, that's just good. a little bit of <laughs> Because if it's up, that's where all the hot air is. You want it on the ground to push the cold air up. And it'll just, it'll just make the air go around. In my bigger greenhouse, my 16 by 20, we had, it's a, it's a great big HOV fan that I bought from you, which is up high and it pushes the air down so it pushes the, the warm air down because even in the winter you're going to get some warm air and keeping it circulating is really truly the secret you don't have to be um any any wizard to know that but it's that movement of air you're absolutely right yeah can you talk a little bit about um the importance of the max min thermometer and uh recording and journaling your greenhouse i do love that i didn't realize the max min thermometer you can go in every day if you've got time and just clear it and then you can see how cold it got overnight and how warm it was during the day because when you start hitting temperatures like 35 degrees celsius or 96 fahrenheit your tomatoes will actually lose their you know the little flowers will fall off and drop off because they can't stand that kind of heat you might be wondering gee why don't i have any tomatoes in my greenhouse and it might be that simple that you just didn't realize you had a, pipe, a spike during the day of course you're quickly going to be ordering a fan or maybe an exhaust system but at least a fan and keeping your windows open your vents open uh, but uh, if you know that it did get that hot during the day then of course you're going to be able to um, realize, oh, it just didn't. I didn't have enough uh, fan uh, going. So by having a maximum thermometer, it lets you know how cold and how warm. And then every day, just write that down. And we have this really great three-year journal. Angela has quite a few of them. I think new greenhouse buyers get one, but yeah, it helps. absolutely, absolutely, it helps you if you start recording three years in a row. First of all, you won't say, oh on May 15th, I had all my strawberries. It won't be that simple. It'll be, gee, I've been recording the temperatures and I've noticed it's gotten a little cooler. It's been raining for 20 days now. I'm gonna add an extra fan because things are really going, going off here. So start to keep track every day. Keep track for more than one year. Just moving my screen here because I got this weird shadow, uh, but start recording. Cause you're gonna find your particular yard the way your greenhouse is orientated, the way that the sun is hitting it, which is going to be different in the winter than in the summer, you're going to find that you need to keep track of how you're able to, to grow. And that's um, just something, it's just so simple. I used to write it on a calendar, but like most people, I throw that calendar out at the end of the year. So having that three years in a block to write down and check back on yourself, it's just a good way of checking up. It literally only takes a minute. I leave it right where I drink my coffee in the morning. So I make my cup of coffee. I sit down, I go, what? Did, I'm actually writing about yesterday. What did I do yesterday? Right. Yesterday, in my garden, in my greenhouse, Donna Balzer took cuttings of finger limes and I put the finger limes in little, I rooted them in rooting hormone, put them in peat moss, put them on my grow area, my little area with my heat mat and plugged in my heat mat and if you don't know what a finger lime is really that's the biggest curiosity I've loved my finger limes I just had them last year and um, quite liked it so I'm just seeing a comment up there someone's going to put in solar power actually I've got a fellow I'm going to visit soon who has done a soul a solar powered battery in the ground so he has little fans that drive the air from his greenhouse into the ground and then that comes back up and heats the greenhouse during the day. I am not going to go to that extent for my greenhouse in Calgary, but I do have one I'm gonna visit. I'm gonna write all about it, Angela, for your blog. He's done a solar 
calls it a solar battery, but it's not really a battery. He's just using the soil to take his warm air out of his greenhouse and storing it in the soil. And with little, basically they call them squirrel fans, little fans that pull the air down. And he is going to use that. And that's quite a well-known system. Even in Alberta, people are using uh, solar powered greenhouses and it's really just, maybe they've got some solar panels that are driving their fans, but the rest of it is all a soil battery, they're calling it. And that is just a big area that you dug out below your greenhouse. And BC greenhouses are quite amenable to that unless you put concrete in. But if you've got ground underneath your greenhouse, you can certainly install a solar battery. Yeah, we have lots of examples of that, actually. So people doing underground or Wallapini greenhouses and mm -hmm. having like the climate batteries um, or em employing geothermal um, we have some, uh, a really neat article on that actually in our new foundation guide that we uh, published okay. this year. Well, sorry, yeah. I missed that. Yeah, thank you, Hannah. She just put it in the link in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah. Um, and a reminder what your grow zone was again. Did My grow zone is a six, seven. Yeah, and well. that's because I'm on the West Coast. Calgary will be a three four in the greenhouse I expect a four or five so it's a little bit warmer so I will keep some of my potted plants in the greenhouse things that can't take that outdoor um, really extreme cold right um Julie had a oh. question about fans and whether it's okay if plants are directly in line with the fan oh Yes, mine are in a way. My peppers all are, right? My fan hits them, but you try not to have them hit that first plant because then it can't move the air as well. So try to move your fan just in the middle of your greenhouse in your pathway where it can be more free flowing. I think that that would be better. Nice. Looks like Charles has uh, incorporated geothermal too. Fantastic. Geothermal is really amazing. You do need a bigger area. Maybe. Charles can talk. I don't know if he can come on and take his unmuting off and tell us how he's done it. That would be fun to hear. Sure. So uh, <laughs> my uh, greenhouse is set three feet into the ground. So it's just the upper portion that is glazed mm -hmm. uh, and uh, has a footing, concrete foundation, uh, about 20 inches under where the finished floor was, was the bottom floor. I ran uh, six inch, uh, corrugated tubing, 100 feet of it, under the floor. I have uh, the intake actually comes up at one of the roof peaks in the back opposite the door and goes up close to the top of the roof peak. And then opposite that, I have a, uh, a wonderful fan that's on a thermostat, both high and low thermostat. Uh, and uh, I just basically set it up so that, oh, when the... I have a probe down into the floor, so I know the temperature of the floor. And when the temperature in the room gets about five degrees Celsius, 10 Fahrenheit, warmer than the floor, then the fan comes on and starts storing heat. Well, that's the that's what I've heard called a solar battery as well. Yeah, the yeah, battery. yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, that yeah, that when I I put in geothermal because you said that word at that time. So yeah, it's it's, yeah. it's functionally a solar battery and then i have a true air to ground geothermal loop too that runs under my main garden underground and so if it gets really cold it, it pulls it out i still need a little bit of heat here in maine though because it it, yeah. it 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 got down to like minus 30 last winter mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. my figs survived there is a very good um, online, I think it was Cornell University that did a workshop and they've got it on YouTube. There's a very good, um, a whole thing about solar, how people can build their own solar. And it sounds exactly like what you've done, which sounds fantastic. So are you saying I should try harder, Charles, and do that myself? <laughs> if you're going to do it, do it before you build. It's a terrible right. thing to try and uh, after. And, you know, and if you got somebody there with a the backhoe, it's easy. Yeah, easy. Yeah, and those walking. types that you're talking about, and you'll see more if you watch if people watch the whole video, are like that weeping tile. They're like those those long flexible hoses. Right. 
You want to get a big, you want a big pipe because you're, you need to push a lot of air through there. Yes. And make sure you get the perforated pipe. Very you important. Want, you don't want condensation inside there because you'll grow mold. So if you get any condensation there, you want it to go into the ground. Fantastic. Anna. And I, 100%, I'm so excited for you. What are you growing in yours then? You said you're growing figs? So we, ha I have, well, I did it so I could grow olives. Okay. Because my other hobby is making balsamic vinegar. So I want to make my own salad dressing. Oh. That, that's my story. <laughs> Okay, well, that's why I'm growing lemons, you see. So what you're saying, if I try a little harder, I could actually grow lemons in my greenhouse in Calgary. I like it. Uh, we tried and we had such a terrible problem with uh, spider mites. At, uh, ah, ah, okay. Well, then you need to get some stratiolepus. It's a type of a beneficial bug. And it can sometimes come in things like worm castings, as innocent as that. Mm -hmm. And you put them on, you, you top dress all your plants in the fall. It can really help. Also, never use grow lights because it's the short days all the spider mites go asleep and um, they'll go asleep. And you start hosing off just your lemons, just hose them off once you're into weather where, where you might get spider mites, which is sort of the March. Like the spider mites do come out of rest in about March and then they start to become a problem. So try again. Try again. I found that with the uh, spider mite. Um, you know, I found that with the, the, the worm castings with that little spider mite beneficial bug, which you can also buy, uh, Stradiolepis humil, it's a complicated name. It's just called a spider mite predator. And it's a really good one. It's easy, easy to use, very tiny. I love that you did those organically, Donna, as opposed yeah. to going to, you know, sprays and yeah, Different because it just, the sprays, even that really innocent ones like the soap mixed with water sounds innocent enough, but it can kill those really good beneficial bugs. And once I went to a talk by an entomologist that said, you know what, you'll kill your bugs for two weeks, but you'll kill the beneficials for up to five years. So, oops, there goes my dog. She just kind of... <laughs> Must have seen the squirrel. We had to come outside. We weren't getting enough Wi-Fi, which is too bad. I loved sitting in my greenhouse, but we're outside. So just checking in, everyone, if there's any um, other questions that you'd like to pose for Donna, um, or just coming up on the hour mark here. We've got, you know, certainly a few more minutes if you've got anything you want to cover. You can just... Oh, Julie um, says, can you see that? It kind of flashes up and then it disappeared. I don't understand. I read, I don't understand. Yeah. So how do you avoid using grow lights? She says, I grow a lot of flowers and veggies from seed here in Vancouver, starting them in January. I think I need the grow lights. You need them when you're growing them indoors, but when you're moving the plants out to your greenhouse, I'm not using grow lights in the greenhouse. So I start a lot of things and just so that I can have more maximized space in my greenhouse. I start a lot of things under grow light indoors, but then there's no spider mites indoors. I've been washing my windows and my windowsills and the spider mites are not in there. I start with fresh soil. I don't reuse soil in my seedlings, so I don't have spider mites indoors. And then I move them out to the greenhouse. And so the spider mites don't start to become active again until March or April. And by that time, if I know I've had a problem, I start ordering the spider mite predators or I use the worm castings that I've been able to buy that have the spider mite predators, stratolepis. It's a really complicated name. I'll write it down and send it to Hannah. Um, it's naturally occurring in some types of worm castings. So they will control themselves. It's just a smaller mite, Hannah, even in Vancouver. So in Vancouver, go ahead, start your things under lights and you know, just have one grow light and then move things out to your greenhouse because there'll be enough light in March and April to start growing outdoors in your greenhouse in Vancouver. She was saying she would love to be able to start in January. Well, I do start a lot in January and I started, as I was saying earlier, um, 
I started my, and you're right, I just saw her say, so no lights in the greenhouse. I don't have grow lights in the greenhouse. I started my arugula, and she's in a very similar region to me, so she could start things like arugula and radishes now or in the next few weeks. I just planted yesterday some arugula in my greenhouse. Last year, I started it from seed directly in my greenhouse, and I was eating it by the end of January. So I'm pushing that a little bit now. I've started it early in my greenhouse about three weeks ago transplanted it off my prop bench into my beds as I've been pulling out those horrible wasabi radishes which I don't like they're gone and I've replaced that with arugula and mizuna and that has been transplanted into the open bed in the greenhouse while uh, last year I just started the arugula from seed at the end of October and that staggers it a bit too but I just wanted a bit of a heads I wanted to have those lovely homemade pizzas in November I didn't want to have to wait till January so I started it earlier I started it three weeks ago right just checking the chat box here for any last final questions and are you still taking questions that you can forward to me or people can absolutely so yeah. I think that it's good for everyone to know a couple things um our BC Greenhouse blog we have um we run it you know, it, it's there for you as a resource. Um, we have an amazing little search tool on the, on the website. So if you have something specific that you're looking for, just enter it into the search tool and then your results will come up. So Donna regularly is a contributor to our blog. We have a very active uh, Facebook page as well as Instagram account. Um, we welcome questions at any time. Um, and oftentimes too, I have to tell you, I love opportunity and ideas. And so oftentimes those come from our customers. So if there are, you know, questions that come and I keep seeing themes of that, we will start building out resource material for you. So we're- and you are forwarded. When you yeah. get questions more than once, you'll forward them to me and say, three people are asking me. So then I actually specifically write a blog post about that topic. So people know that yeah. we're there. We're there to help. Absolutely, because it's and there um, is no one answer, right? Everyone's in a different location, different style greenhouse, different you know, different methods. So there's no one answer. So feel free to ask because we might not have touched on that particular question yet. And if you're asking and thinking, there's going to be other people thinking the same thing. Yeah, absolutely. We have some very good resources on that Donna's done in the past on buying seeds, um, what to look for. Um, I remember having worked here for almost 12 years and learning the word parthenocarpic. I've never <laughs> heard that word before. Maybe you can touch on that for a second because that was a bit of an um, amazing light bulb moment for me. Well, if it's your first time growing in a greenhouse, you may not realize that the normal cucumbers that you grow outdoors that expect bees to come by and visit them and move along the pollen and then produce the cucumbers, you might not realize that in the greenhouse that commercial growers purchase bees to come into their greenhouses. They purchase them and release them in the greenhouse. And you're just not big enough if you have a home greenhouse and you're going to miss them and you're going to miss pollinating, even if you're rushing around trying to spread pollen from one cucumber to the next. So luckily the developers have developed a cucumber that's parthenocarpet, so it doesn't need to be pollinated. It can produce a cucumber. It's like magic. And that's why those long English cucumbers often do not have any seeds because they didn't produce any male parts or female parts. They're parthenocarpic. They just produce cucumbers because of the age of the plant and the conditions in the greenhouse instead of being pollinated. So this is kind of fun. Yeah. Seems to me we have lots of customers who had trouble with cucumbers this year. Right, because it was so cold in so many areas for so long in the spring. And that was one part of the problem. And maybe they weren't using parthenocarpic green, you know, cucumbers. They were maybe just trying to move in the ones they had outside. The other problem I noticed, because we have one bed that was built out with wood, just one bed, we thought we would try it. And that was about five years ago. And it's got pill bugs in it. It's very hard to control pill bugs. You can put uh, cornmeal down on the ground and they will eat it and then die it's kind of sad for the pill bugs but pill bugs really are irritating you've got that huge cucumber it has to get that moisture moved up the bed and they will scratch away and kill the base of the plant 
So if you have wood beds, you may have pill bugs, you may have a problem. And so try to get away from a situation like we we're going to have to take that one bed out. And the final, so cold temperature, wrong type of cucumber, and then also the, the pill bugs. But then finally, cucumbers are one of those particular plants that needs to have new soil every year. So they're better in a pot, like a pepper or a tomato. They're better in a pot, or you have to change out a lot of soil every year. So just have your cucumber. You probably only need one because you can get 50 or 60 cucumbers on one plant if it's in clean soil. In a clean pot, they've actually cleaned because there's a lot of pest pressure and just bacteria pressure and virus and problems that can go wrong if the conditions aren't perfect. So it's worth changing out your soil for your cucumbers. Put it in a big plastic pot, wash it out at the end of the piece of that new soil. Simplest solution. Okay, do we have any final questions for Donna before we jump off and enjoy the rest of our day? <laughs> and sorry about that er earlier uh, situation there with the uh, okay. Wi Fi dying. That's just, that's the life of technology, right? Well, yeah, well, thanks to everyone. And thank you so much for joining us and giving yeah. us those great ideas. I love this feedback. And I think we should do a whole session just on that. I always try to prepare something, but I think it's really nice when we have this time at the end. That's my favorite part. Yeah. Thank you, Donna. You're thanks, a Angela. And we appreciate you so much. Okay. Thank you so much. See you soon. Bye, Bye -bye. everyone.